We are in Job chapter 14. It's ready to look at verse 20. And as I said, I'm filling in for, for Josh. And I don't have his secret sauce, you know, with this Job class like he does. So I'll need your help to uh, work through this. So please bring your comments and questions. And if I ask a question, try to try to work with me on that. We'll get through this together. So, of course, the book of Job is where uh, the devil, you know, the, the book starts out where uh, Job is a righteous man, but the devil accuses Job and says, well, you know, he's only righteous because you're being so nice to him. So Satan gets an opportunity and permission from the Lord to, to give him a hard time. So Job's been st struggling through these things having lost his family and had lost his health and his friends come to comfort him but uh, they have in their mind well if you're suffering then logically you must have sinned and you need to repent but of course that is not at all what has happened so this that's the whole conflict of the book is this argument between between his friends and Job about that so let's just get into our text here this is um, Job continuing to have some comments here. And I think we were almost done with, with chapter 14, but we wanted to look at these last three verses. So let's just read that. And I've got up on the screen here, I've got the New American Standard on the left and the New King James on the right. I figure most of us probably use one or the other of those or something close. So you can follow along in your Bible or whatever. Job 14.20 you forever overpower him, and he departs. You change his appearance and send him away. His sons achieve honor, but he does not know it. Or they become insignificant, but he does not perceive it. But his body pains him, and he mourns only for himself. And so, of course, this comes on the end of a larger discussion where Job is talking about how death is coming to him too soon, this idea. Uh, thoughts about, about these final three verses. Uh, what's he talking about? Her sons will achieve honor, but he does not know it. How would he not know that? It started with a hard question, I guess. <laughs> it is kind of a hard question. He's not talking about his own son, is he? I think he's talking about how He's going to die, or, or men in general die, and then they're no longer present to see what happens with their sons and their children, to see what goes on. So verse 20, uh, you, you forever overpower him and he departs. You change his appearance and send him away. I think send him away in the sense of death. You're, you're dismissing him now to death. And so now life goes on, not, not the man who died his life, but other people's lives go on. His son's lives go on. His sons achieve honor, but he does not know it, or they become insignificant and he does not perceive it. So his son may uh, be successful or his son may be a, a failure in some way with business or whatever, but this man who has died is in the grave and he's not uh, part of that. Uh, but his body pains him and he mourns only for himself. That part's a little puzzling to me because if he's dead, why is his body paining him? Um, I'm not too sure about that part. All right. So I think it's the idea that, that, that we die and we don't really know what's going on. It's sort of this uh, kind of the Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanity type of idea. Uh, Job is in despair, of course. He's struggling and suffering with all these things. And he's looking at, uh, looking at death in the face, so to speak. All right, maybe starting a new chapter will be a better fresh start here. Job chapter 15, so now we change gears from that completing Job's speech. Now Eliphaz uh, has a speech and I uh, kind of lost track. I, I know all the friends have spoken in turn and I think this might be then Eliphaz's second, second turn. Um, 
So he's spoken before, and now he's speaking again. Of course, they're growing in frustration uh, because, you know, Job continues to say, well, I'm innocent. I am actually haven't done sins that you're accusing me of. And then these friends are saying, well, but you have sinned, and you aren't uh, agreeing to that. And so they're frustrated with each other because they both have a different idea about what the truth is on the matter. And, uh, of course, that all gets worked out at the end of the book. But, but right now we're in this conflict. What's that? They want him to come clean. Right, because they think he's done wrong and you need to repent. Because and, God wouldn't do it. Right. That's the common sense, right? Well, why else would you be suffering like this if you aren't being punished for the sin, right? That's what they think. Yeah. But they are wrong. <laughs> and generally speaking, that there's some truth to that, right? Uh, Proverbs talks about those concepts where you know, you do foolish things and you'll have these consequences. And so they're just assuming that that's what's happened. We don't realize how, how much the devil does in our world, I don't think. Right. The devil, he's very busy now. He, yeah. He was busy then. We have a little bit of a look behind the curtain here in this book, don't we? That Satan is orchestrating some things. You know, the Lord is allowing him to do that, but then Satan is doing these difficult, bad things to Job. And we can infer, perhaps, that when righteous people suffer today, it's the same idea. Yes. Okay. Let's look at uh, maybe just first, first six verses here at a time. Uh, a little note says, Eliphaz says, Job presumes much. Let's see here. Job 15, 1 through 6. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, responded, Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he argue with useless talk or with words which are not profitable? Indeed, you do away with reverence and hinder meditation before God. For your guilt teaches your mouth, and you choose the language of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I, and your own lips testify against you. Were you the first man to be born, or were you uh, brought forth before the hills? So asking him some challenging questions here. So what's the, what's the thrust of what Eliphaz is trying to get at here? He's trying to say, Job's full of hot air. Yeah, Job, you're full of hot air. You're a windbag. <laughs> you're saying all this stuff to try to justify yourself, I guess, would maybe be Eliphaz's perspective, right? But it's just a bunch of baloney. You're just a bunch of hot air, right? And, and he's going on to say, uh, verses 4 through 6, uh, you're, you're a bad guy, right? Uh, you do away with reverence and hinder meditation to God, for your your guilt teaches your mouth, and your you choose the language of the crafty. You're you're doing things that wicked people do. You're saying, you know, because again, they his friend doesn't believe him, so he thinks he's lying when he says he's innocent. So he's accusing him of lying and having wicked speech, and crafty speech, and that his own lips, his own words are condemning him because he's lying, but of course, Job is not lying. That's the whole conflict. Okay? Were you the first man to be born, or were you brought forth before the hills? What do you think he's meaning by asking that question? Yeah, are you like are you in, are you the principal person? Are you in charge of everything? I guess I'm getting a little ahead of us. We haven't read seven through through. Uh, where am I going to stop here? Let's read seven through nine. Just a little, little chunk here. Seven through nine. Were, were you the first band to be born, or were you uh, brought forth before the hills? Do you hear the secret counsel of God? and limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that we do not? So what does Eliphaz think Job thinks about himself? It's 
sort of like like Job is all that or something, or he's so wise, or that Eliphaz thinks that Job thinks he's so wise and has all the answers, but Eliphaz thinks he's wrong in that, right? Because because they have this conflict. Kind of like, what do you know that I don't know? Yeah, yeah. Who do you think you are? We might ask that question, right? Uh, do you have a secret... Uh, you know, like the president has the red phone that the launch the nuclear missiles or something. Do you have some sort of phone that you can talk to God and you know you have a secret uh, connection with God, as it says, verse 8. Do you, have, do you hear the secret counsel of God and, and limit wisdom to yourself? you have secret knowledge because you, you're so close to God? And, of course, he is right with God, but go ahead. I was saying, if I was Job listening to this, it would make me upset to hear that. Exactly. And, that's, and I think that's exactly his reaction, too. They're, they're all getting upset, both sides of this, right? Because they both have a different perception of what's actually going on. And really, they're, they're both wrong, right? Because obviously his friends are wrong in their assertion that Job is sinful because he's not. But Job is confused too because he keeps being upset and kind of blaming God for these things that Satan is doing to him. So everyone's a little confused except us. We have, we have the whole story as we've read the book. Of course, God revealed that to us. He knows all of everything, but we have been given more of the story, and so we, we can see behind that curtain too. Do you think that his friends are blaming God more than Job is? I think the friends are blaming Job. Mm -hmm. I think they think Job is being, number one, he's, he's sinned, and he's like hiding it from himself or lying to himself or trying to lie to them. He's sort of deceiving himself and he's stubborn. He is pretty stubborn, <laughs> but he's right. It's okay to be stubborn when you're right. He <laughs> won't admit what's, what he's done. Yeah. But of course, he, there's a good reason for that. Yeah. His friends know that he must have sinned given the obvious nature of his suffering. Clearly, he must have sinned because I mean, all of this. Right. He was, he was a wealthy man with a big family, lost all of his possessions, lost all of his family except for his wife, and his wife sort of giving him a hard ashes. time. Yeah. So. He's been brought low, for sure. All right. All right, so let's look at uh, 10. Let's see, where are we? Let's go through 10 through 13. Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. Are the consolations of God too small for you? Even the words spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away? And why do your eyes flash? that you should turn your spirit against God and allow such words to go out of your mouth. So what is Eliphaz talking about here with the gray-haired people? What does that have to do with anything? They're talking about themselves being old? I think, well, they're equating that gray hair with age and wisdom. and. Perhaps they're talking about themselves, or at least they're talking about, we are in the tradition of this wisdom. We know that whenever someone's suffering, it's because they did something wrong. That's what our grandfathers have told us. That's what Proverbs tells us. And so we have all of the elders on our side, and maybe, and maybe they themselves are older than Job, and so they're pulling the age card <laughs> and saying, this is wisdom, and you are wrong, Job. I think that's the idea. Uh, the consolations of God maybe is a reference to the kind words, these comforters. <laughs> put, put that in quotes, right? His friends have been comforting him and trying to tell him kind words. Eliphaz is saying, you know, we've been speaking God's truth to you in kind ways, and, and you, that's not good enough for you, Job. You're not going to repent. 
I think that's the general idea in these verses here. All right. Let's inch our way forward here. 14 through 16. What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less one who is detestable and corrupt, man who drinks iniquity like water. Okay, is he comparing some things here? We've got, we've got man in verse 14, and we've got his holy ones in verse 15. What are we talking about, you think, there? The heavens? This is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, I think he's saying, Job, you're saying you're righteous, but you're just a man. Men, men aren't perfect. True, right? Uh, and then verse 15, he puts no trust in his holy ones. I think that's a reference to the angels uh, and the heavens, which would be parallel. The angels reside in heaven, right? He, he puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is detestable, you know, you a man, you sinful man Job, uh, man who drinks iniquity like water. So uh, that gets into some weird topics about fallen angels and this sort of thing. We see some of that in Revelation referred to. Uh, I think this was earlier in the book, too. Um, well, here, at, let me ask this question. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 6. I mean, that's kind of where this all started, right? Uh, now there was a day when the sons of God, which I think is a, a reference to angels again in this, in this context, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them and the Lord said to Satan for where you know they have this discussion right so what's Satan I think I think Josh posed this question I don't know if we ever really answered it but why is Satan there before God right that seems awfully strange it seems to be this maybe this throne scene in heaven with God and the God's servants the angels are there and then Satan's there I don't have a good answer for that but you know that maybe is consistent with what uh, with what's being said here by Eliphaz. Of course, we always kind of wonder when it's not Job speaking; it's one of his friends. Are they speaking the truth? Because obviously their their fundamental premise is wrong that Job is sinful. But oftentimes they talk in general about about God and and speak true things. So a little bit of a puzzle. But nevertheless, there's. Interesting point. He's saying, how can you really be righteous when e even some angels don't, aren't righteous? How much less you? You're just a, a human. I thought that was referring to that not even the angels know when Judgment Day is going to be. Here in this verse? Yeah, because it says, Behold, God puts no trust in his holy one. Like God is oh. the only one who knows the yeah, if you, you're connecting that to some things Jesus said, and, and you very well might be onto something. I, I didn't make that connection from here. I hadn't thought about that. Interesting. Yes? I actually wonder, going back to chapter 1, if that even is that scene in heaven. It would make a whole lot more sense to me if it was all happening on earth. Well, it's where the Lord is. In the holy presence of the Lord. So wherever we in, imagine that being, as we try to think about these spiritual things, it's still an interesting question why Satan would be in the presence of the Lord, wherever you envision that occurring. Well, in the burning bush, was that God there? Yes. The or the angel of the Lord? Or, I am? Yeah. But, 
Or are you, are you saying that because of what Rachel said about yeah. on earth? And that's generally what we think of, what I think of, when we think about the Garden of Eden, where God walked in the midst of the garden. He was, there was sort of this marrying of heaven and earth. God was, in some sense, there on the earth with them. Of course, then they sinned and cast out of the garden and no longer in the presence of God like that. And that's sort of then we look to to the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells and there is no temple because uh, God is just there, right? God is the light, that sort of thing. Anyway, getting a little far afield there. Other thoughts on that? Okay. Probably aren't going to solve all those questions, but... So verse 17, verses 17 through 19. <clears throat> I had a question. Yes. Uh, on that first chapter, you know, God was uh, questioned by Satan what would happen, you know, if he didn't have all that he has now. And uh, in verse 16, it says, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up all the sheep and the servants and consumed them. So Satan didn't do the destroying, God did. Which verse is that? Verse 10, uh, 16. The fire of God. Of Elohim. Yeah, so... I think the idea is that that spirit, spiritual fire from the heavens. In verse 15, though, it says Sabians. What, is that Sabians? Sabians. That's a, that's a foreigners. That's a foreign country. It says they, they killed all the oxen. There's the Sabians and there's the Chaldeans in verse 17. So there's these di foreign invaders that come. There's the fire from heaven or the fire of God that's mentioned. And it's, not the, it's not the word. Uh, I know Josh made this point earlier that the word for Yahweh, the Lord, the specific name for our God, isn't isn't used here in this word in this verse. It's just more of that word for spiritual beings. So he killed the servants. Yeah. So he had all kinds of things coming down upon him. So it could be the case that that Satan, given given permission from God, was able to from the spiritual realms and fire from heaven, so to speak, and then manipulate these invaders to come and cause all this chaos, to, which is what Job is now experiencing, all of this loss, right? So, interesting point, but I don't know that, if it, ha if it had the word for the Lord there, I would, I would have more questions, but I think it's more of the spiritual uh, realm is what we're to think about there. Good thinking. Okay. We're ready for verse 17. Chapter 15, 17. Let's read 17 through 19. <clears throat> I will tell you, listen to me. And what I have seen, I will also declare. What wise men have told and have not concealed from their fathers, to whom alone the land was given, and no alien passed among them. So I think what he's saying here is kind of what he said before about the, the gray hair and the, the elder idea uh, that I have, I have the wise answer. I am Eliphaz. I have the wise answers because I have wisdom behind me. Listen to what I have to say. Of course, then he's going to go on to say a bunch of stuff here. Thoughts on that? All right. So starting in verse 20, we kind of have a longer uh, section. Basically, I would preface it really to the rest of the uh, rest of this chapter, chapter 15, uh, 20 through 35, where it's sort of the, the profile of the wicked man, and the wicked man is Job. Okay. So here here he goes, starting in verse 20. The wicked man writhes in pain all his days, and numbered 
are the years stored up for the ruthless. And of course, who's writhing in pain, right? Job. So Job is the wicked man. That's what he's saying. Verse 21. The sounds of terror are in his ears. While at peace, the destroyer comes upon him. He does not believe that he will return from darkness. And he is destined for the sword. He wanders about for food, saying, where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is at hand. Distress and anguish terrify him. They overpower him like a king ready for the attack. Because he has stretched out his hand against God and conducts himself arrogantly against the Almighty, he rushes headlong at him with his massive shield. For he has covered his face with fat and made his thighs heavy with flesh. He has lived in desolate cities, in houses no one would inhabit, which are destined to become ruins. He will not become rich, nor will his wealth endure, and his grain will not bend down to the ground. He will not escape from darkness. The flame will wither his shoots, and by the breath of his mouth he will go away. Let him not trust in emptiness, deceiving himself, for emptiness will be his reward. It will be accompanied before his time, and his palm branch will not be green. He will drop off his unripe grape like the vine, and will cast off his flower like the olive tree. For the company of the godless is barren, and fire consumes the tents of the corrupt. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity, and their minds prepare deception. So did anything jump out at you there that maybe would relate to Job? Kind of gave away that first part. Go ahead. Yeah, something. I've been, it kind of occurred to me a while ago, and I've been wondering about it. It was that the, uh, when these tragedies occurred, one by one, uh, there was one servant left, and they come to tell him, what happened to those servants? Where did they go? They're not helping him. It's an interesting point. Yeah, they kind of go out of the story, don't they? I'm sorry, that, that, that yeah. as if something that when you were back there that uh, helped up in my mind, and now I wonder what happened to the servants. You know, presumably he didn't lose all of his possessions, including his servants. I mean, his... Be, what, seven of them? Yeah, but he, he would have, like his land was destroyed and his crops and his uh, animals and his family were destroyed, but he would have presumably owned the land still, and so yeah. he still had some possessions, but he was just sort of... They all come to him to tell him what happened. Yeah. yeah. But then, what happened to them? Well, and his wife is still around, too. We, right. we haven't heard from her in a while. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that, but uh, it might be that he's just so sick and in so much pain it doesn't really matter that there's servants there because he still has they can't help him plus the pain of losing his children they can't really help him that's maybe an answer but but it's an interesting point because some of these story elements kind of go away and like what happened you lose one child and you don't never really get over it so you know seven of them right like all of them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's in a bad place. But that's, that's an interesting point because uh, we don't have all those details that are told to us. So this profile of the wicked man, um, down in verse 27, <clears throat> talks about fat, which is kind of a strange thing. He has covered his face with fat and made his thighs heavy with flesh. <clears throat> I think what he's saying is the wicked man, again, Job, he's, he's tailoring this to Job, and he's just saying in general, the wicked man, he's, he's so wicked and rich and, and in excess, you know, he has, that would be the idea of fat, so a rich person would be a person who would have extra weight, a little bit different than in our culture. And so that would be something you think about kings and rich people. 
So this person is just uh, living in excess. But then verse 28, he has lived in desolate cities and houses, no one will have him. So it's sort of like this turn of fortunes, right? He will not become rich, nor will his wealth endure, his grain. So all these things, bad things. He's losing his grain. He's not going to escape the darkness. So all the, the troubles and struggles that have come upon Job seem to be what's happened here. I think earlier in the, when his friends first came to him, and that may have been in chapter 1, it says they didn't recognize him. Remember that? Because he was, well, he probably because he he'd lost his weight and kind of all dirty and so distraught. So he may have uh, transformed from being a rich man to being a poor man over some time and uh, <clears throat> kind of withering away. Um, verse 29 talks about his wealth will not endure. So again, think about how his property had been taken by the raiders. We just talked about the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans. And then all of the, the fire from heaven. So the verse 30 talks about the flame. The flame will wither his shoots. That's what my mom was just talking about. The, the fire from God or the fire from heaven that came. Um, <clears throat> And then down in verse 34, there's a reference to fire again. Um, verse 34 also says, For the company of the godless, so the bad people, the wicked people, the company of the godless is barren. And fire consumes the tents of the corrupt. So barren is a word to use for people who are not fruitful and that they do not have children. They do not have children. So it's kind of taken a low blow at Job, who just lost his children. We just talked about that too, right? He, Eliphaz is <clears throat> pointing that out. Well, the wicked people, the company of the godless, they're barren. So you're one of those, Job, because you're barren now, and you're, you're part of the godless. Again, misinterpreting all of these things happening to Job and attributing them all to Job's sins, when in fact that's not what's going on here. Any other thoughts on that? He says every once in a while we shouldn't assume something. And, and that's exactly what these friends did. They assumed they knew what was going on. And if, if Job would just come forward and confess, and, and uh, he would, all these troubles would be over. And that's one practical lesson we can take from Job, right? Because we, assume. yeah, we encounter people going through things and we have our set of experiences and our wisdom and mm -hmm. we try to figure it out <laughs> and if we assume too much we can be like these friends they're well-meaning as as josh has pointed out they're well-meaning they're just wrong they're not wise because they aren't actually evaluating this correctly uh, we need to leave leave a little room for us to say i don't really know all the things Yeah. And generally speaking, that's right. Right? That if you uh, just take anything, if you start a car business, a car salesman business, and you rip people off and you're dishonest, well, before too long, people are going to figure that out and you're going to go out of business because you have a reputation of being a shyster. That's just how it works. But we can't extrapolate that and say, well, well, John Smith, he started up a, a used car dealership and, and he went out of business, so then he definitely was dishonest when maybe he just <laughs> maybe he just didn't have a good business plan. You know, There's all kinds of reasons that, that you might have a failed business or whatever it is. Bad things happen. Uh, and it's not necessarily because of this or that. All right. Well, hey, it's 7.45, so why don't we say we're going to stop there, and we'll let Josh pick up, Lord willing, in Job 16, Job chapter 16 next time. So I wasn't sure how far we would get in Job, so I looked a little bit ahead. And if you look at Job chapter 16, down in verse 17... 
There's some interesting things that Job says there. Job 16, verse 17. Although there is no violence in my hands, and my prayer is pure, again, Job is indicating, I haven't done anything wrong. I have a good heart. I'm doing the right thing. But he's still struggling, right? He's still suffering. Verse 18. O earth, do not cover my blood, and let there be no resting place for my cry. You know, don't let me be buried in the grave, is the idea. Don't, I don't want to die from this. Verse 19, even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my advocate is on high. So we're sort of appealing to the Lord. His witness is in heaven, the Lord, right? My friends are my scoffers. My eye weeps to God. Oh, that a man might plead with God as a man with his neighbor. So he wants to plead with God. Of course, that's as the book develops. He ultimately has that opportunity to actually interact with God. But thinking about this idea of uh, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high, which is another way to say in heaven, right? You know, we might turn to... Uh, Romans 8, Romans 8, 34. Look at a passage there. Of course, we're going to see all this in Christ. Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us. Christ is that advocate in heaven, interceding for us. And we recently studied 1 John, and there's another verse there that can, we can draw on for this idea as well. 1 John, the end of chapter 1. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's one of the kind of repeated themes of the book. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Of course, this is a letter John's writing to Christians, right? So this is for us to think about and as Christians. If we sin, if we, do, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so that's Going back to Job, you know, Job wants to have this advocate in heaven. We have that. And Jesus died for us as Christians. We've taken advantage of that free gift. But he also did it for the whole world. Anyone can follow and obey Christ. And in faith, they can obey and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and remain faithful until death will receive the crown of life. So if there's anyone that that speaks to tonight. He needs to make a change. We're going to sing a song here. I am resolved. You know, as we get to the new year, we make New Year's resolutions, right? And you're resolved to do whatever it is that you're going to do for your New Year's resolution. Well, if you're not right with God, you need to make a resolution to change that and to act upon that. So if you're resolved to make a change and you want some help or some prayers to the church, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the song together.